Welcome, everyone. Today, we're diving into a hot topic that's as spicy as it is crucial Europe's former empires and their long lasting impact on today's global economy. If you ever wondered why some countries are rich while others continue to struggle, we'll explain it here. And trust me, you're going to want to sit down for this. Why? Because we'll also point fingers at the elites, governments, and institutions that are still, to this day, messing everything up. So pour your coffee and let's go in deep. Before we dive into it, let's set the stage with a question. Why, in 2024, are developed and developing countries still facing such enormous economic disparities? Wasn't globalization supposed to level the playing field? Wasn't the internet going to make distance irrelevant and ensure that capital and technology flowed freely around the world, igniting prosperity everywhere? Well, it turns out things aren't so simple. And you guessed it, one of the culprits is the colonial past we often sweep under the rug. That's right, today's modern powers aren't rich by luck or hard work alone. No, they inherited systems designed for exploitation and inequality. From the United States to the United Kingdom, these once mighty empires established extractive institutions in the countries they colonized, institutions that left a legacy of poverty, underdevelopment, and social instability long after they packed their bags and left. The recent Nobel Prize in Economics recognizes work that traces these persistent disparities back to one simple truth. Colonial institutions are still wreaking havoc. This year's $1.1 million prize was awarded to Darren Asemoglu, Simon Johnson, and James A. Robinson. They've spent much of their careers illuminating how historic institutions shape the prosperity or poverty of nations today. Their findings? Simple but grim. If you happen to be a country colonized by European powers, your destiny was often defined by whether they decided to settle there or extract resources. Great news for wealthy countries, terrible news for places in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia that Europe didn't want as vacation spots. In countries where Europeans faced high disease mortality rates, meaning they couldn't easily settle. They set up what we call extractive institutions. Instead of building infrastructure, healthcare, or education systems, the colonial powers imposed crushing taxes and labor systems, leading to permanent inequality. The elites of these colonized nations eventually took over, and surprise, they continued the exploitative practices, perpetuating widespread poverty and inequality. But how is this relevant to today's economy? Well, people tend to underestimate just how powerful institutions are in determining whether a country will thrive or falter. The research by Assemiglu, Johnson, and Robinson emphasizes that economic prosperity does not come simply from having natural resources, hardworking populations, or a favorable climate. No, the real secret sauce is institutions that are transparent, inclusive, accountable, and democratic. Countries that democratize and pay attention this applies even today see their economies improve over time. But here's the kicker. Setting up democratic institutions isn't easy. If we're looking at problem areas today, think about what's going on in countries like Zimbabwe, Venezuela, or North Korea. You see profoundly extractive institutions there, where a tiny elite holds on to power and wealth, while the vast majority are impoverished. Colonizers may have left these countries, but corrupt local elites filled the power vacuum preserving the same structures of exploitation and authoritarian control, and making sure the benefits stayed locked in the hands of the few. Meanwhile, workers are kept in poverty, economic development is stalled, and global inequality deepens. As Asemoglu said at a recent press conference, democracy is not a panacea. Sure, if you can establish democratic, inclusive institutions, your economy could start growing in eight to nine years. But let's not kid ourselves. It's a tough game. Dictatorships don't fall easily. Corrupt elites don't step aside because someone points out they've been underserving their populations. Just look at the Arab Spring initial excitement, followed by institutional failures. You see, in many developing countries, the same old extractive institutions have gone digital. You now have oppressive political regimes enabled by digital surveillance systems, particularly in places like China. Now, there's a significant debate about whether technology, especially artificial intelligence, will help equalize conditions around the world, but Asemoglu isn't buying it. In an interview with Bloomberg, he made it clear, a lot of money is going to get wasted. In fact, we should be deeply suspicious that AI might end up reinforcing the power of entrenched elites instead of dismantling old hierarchies. And it doesn't stop there. Let's analyze Europe itself. Now, you could say, well, Europe's economies are mature. They've done their bit. But oh no, Europe is a mess from another angle right now. 
And it's not just the legacy of colonialism they've inflicted on others that's catching up with them. It's their post-colonial mismanagement. From Brexit to the Eurozone crisis, many European countries have spent the last two decades playing a game of economic Jenga. And let me tell you, they're pulling out the wrong blocks. Take the European Union, an institution formed to promote economic stability and prosperity. Yet what happened when the Euro crisis hit? Wealthier countries like Germany and France imposed strict austerity measures on struggling economies like Greece, Portugal, and Spain. Instead of fostering long-term growth, these policies prolonged economic suffering for millions. This is a clear case of modern-day extraction, this time financial, rather than physical resources, but extraction all the same. Brexit is another perfect example. Rather than confronting the realities of their colonial past and integrating into the global economy more responsibly, Britain has been doubling down on isolationism. The result? A self-inflicted economic recession. Former Prime Minister Theresa May famously said, Brexit means Brexit. And guess what? Economic chaos means economic chaos. Britain's deliberate decision to sever ties with its biggest trading partner, nay, its biggest economic institution, is still wreaking havoc on its working class, while feeding more wealth to the financial elite. The economic fallout is impossible to ignore. Food prices have skyrocketed, businesses have pulled out, and investment has dwindled. Let's not forget that one of these Nobel laureates, Simon Johnson, served briefly as the chief economist at the IMF during another little indiscretion, the global financial crisis of 2008. This wasn't just a crisis of bad mortgages. It was an institutional failure. Banks were allowed to run wild, financial watchdogs fell asleep at the wheel, and the result? The world plunged into the worst recession since the Great Depression. Lehman Brothers collapsed, stock markets followed, governments rushed to bail out banks, but who didn't get bailed out? You and I. Ordinary people were left to struggle with lower wages, unemployment, and public sector cuts, while rich elites managed to keep most of their wealth. Have we learned any lessons from that crisis? According to Johnson and Asemoglu's thinking, no, not really. We live in a world where the collapse of major institutions can still cause widespread havoc. And in fact, inequality has only grown since the aftermath of the financial crises. In the United States, for example, the wealthiest 1% now holds more wealth than they did before 2008, while wage growth for median workers remains stagnant. This can't be the system we continue to call prosperous. As we move into the era of artificial intelligence, Many have raised the alarm that we may be gearing up for the next massive institutional failure, one that might dwarf the financial crisis. AI promises productivity gains and high-tech industries, but one look at history tells us that new technologies don't automatically benefit everyone. Remember how the Industrial Revolution made a few industrialists rich while leading to child labor, rampant inequality, and slum cities? Well, without the proper institutions to guide AI's development, especially in developing countries where colonial histories have left people vulnerable, we could be seeing a new form of digital extraction, where tech companies, billionaires, and dictatorships use AI to consolidate power, manipulate elections, and control populations at a scale never seen before. Asemoglu and Johnson emphasize that institutions need to be built in ways that prevent this from happening. You can't just hand over AI to corporate elites or authoritarian regimes and expect that innovation by itself will lead to broad-based prosperity. If we're not careful, we'll create societies where the few control limitless wealth and power while the many suffer from mass unemployment or digital surveillance. In conclusion, the work of this year's Nobel Prize recipients serves as a forceful reminder of how our world is shaped by the institutions we inherit and the systems we build. Today's global economy is not an even playing field. The ghosts of colonialism linger, enabling today's elites to rig the system in their favor. And unless we make fundamental changes to the institutions that govern us, those disparities will only grow wider. Whether it's through democracy, cutting-edge technology, or economic reform, one thing is clear. None of us will be free to prosper unless we reshape the extractive institutions that continue to haunt both rich and poor countries alike. Until next time, stay informed, stay skeptical, and don't let the ruling elites fool you into thinking things will just get better on their own.